Hello, this is Professor Gavor. I'm happy to speak to you today about metrics, the use of metrics in operations and supply chain management. They can be called key performance metrics, key performance indicators, KPIs, which is an abbreviation that's very commonly used, indicators, but basically we're talking about measures, metrics, indicators. Let's start with Lord Kelvin. Yeah, that's a guy that you probably remember in chemistry class that invented the absolute zero scale. He was William Thompson, Baron, of, Baron Kelvin of Largs. He was born in 1824 in Belfast and passed away in 1907. Uh, he was a Scottish scientist, engineer, and mathematician. And he said this, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And I use this all the time, and it wasn't until maybe a year ago that I realized it was actually a quote from Lord Kelvin. And normally what people in supply chain management, quality management say um, in this regard is, if you cannot measure it, certainly you cannot improve it. But then you also don't know if anything you did in an effort to improve it had any impact if there's no measurement, if you don't establish some sort of baseline from which to judge and compare. Now, a profound statement from Lord Kelvin is a little bit of levity. He also said this, uh, the radio has no future, x-rays are clearly a hoax, and of course, the airplane is scientifically impossible. So I guess you got to take the good and the bad with what uh, Lord Kelvin said, but I think this statement is something that has resonated with people all over. So he went on to say, if, uh, I often say that when you can measure what you're speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. But when you cannot measure it, you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of meager and unsatisfactory kind. There is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more precise measurement. To a certain degree, that's definitely true. But in the pendulum of, okay, we're measuring nothing, and now we're getting into the kick of measuring all kinds of things, you can try to overmeasure. In some places, there's, there's just nothing you can find to measure what it is, the outputs of the process that you're trying to, to study. And you had some readings about that. So the history of quality and measurement are linked, and quality is part of operations management. It's part of uh, supply chain management. So these two things are linked. Uh, it follows the history and development of measurement. You cannot manage quality without measurements and regular feedback about the measures. Uh, so you have to worry about the measuring device precision, accuracy, and reliability. And when I say people overuse measures, well, they try to apply measures where they don't have good numbers or it's not doesn't lend itself well to numerical analysis or numericize, numericization of what it is you're trying to measure. You don't get the precision you want. You might not get the accuracy. You might not get the reliability. So precision is like how many decimal places can you measure it? I mean, if you can only measure things to an inch, that's something. If you measure things to tenth of an inch, well, you can be more precise. A hundredth of an inch, a thousandth of an inch. So microns. And is the measurement accurate? Is the device you're using accurate to measure what you're trying to measure? And if people are measuring it over and over again and different people use the same measuring devices or different versions of the same measuring device, is the accuracy reliable? Oftentimes, this has been led, this innovation in quality, by the innovations in, in armaments. Um, Japanese swords from centuries ago are highly valued because they learned something about heat treating and the process of making these swords that were incredible. Uh, Google, Jap you know, uh, amazing historical Japanese swords. And you'll find plenty of YouTubes that talk about how why these things are so priceless and uh, the amount of care, the number of times they folded the steel and 
and pounded it into the right shape and then how they heat treat the edge of the blade only not the back of the, not the whole blade but just the edge of the blade uh, muskets when firearms were first introduced they didn't have any replaceable parts they were all made uniquely so if I had a musket and you had a musket and both our muskets broke there was very little probability I could take the parts from yours and the parts from mine and just make a new musket out of them. It, it didn't happen. But with the Industrial Revolution, replace, replaceable parts became a huge thing. Um, and then there's well-defined standardized processes at, which key, at key points at which measurements must be taken. And there's, uh, you know, some of the two oldest, so I guess we're talking about military and booze here, um, is winemaking and the beer standard in Germany, which are some of the earliest quality standards to be able to produce consistent quality products. And you have to measure, there's measurement points in that well-defined standard process if which you adhere to them, you will get good results. If you don't, you will get variation in the results you get. So measurement in terms of business and in terms of supply chain management, in terms of operations management, is the act of quantifying the performance criteria of organizational units, goods and services, processes, people, and other business activities. It sounds like it's a tremendous span of things. As I said before, some things lend themselves very well to it. If you're making precision parts for a Rolex watch, well, then there's all kinds of physical measurements you can do. And if you have really accurate measuring devices and people running them, you can get excellent feedback. And the reason that Rolex runs so well and accurately is the precision of how those parts all when you assemble it, uh, work together to keep very accurate time. But there's other things that don't react well to measure. I mean, you know, when we talk about measurements in business, we talk about money. Money is very measurable and it's very additive and it's very subtractive. If I have my money and your money, we add it together, we have our money. If I have money and I spend some of it, I can subtract off what I spent and then see what, uh, how much money I have left over. So the ultimate measure in businesses are profits, revenues, and costs. And we, people have gotten very good. People have dedicated their lives to those measures, and I think we call them accountants. Good measures provide scorecards, scorecard performance. You know, you put all your measurements together and you have some good view of how things are happening. They help you identify performance gaps and they make uh, accomplishments if you've closed those performance gaps and made improvements in your business processes to make improvements in the results that you're getting. They're visible to the workforce, certainly the financial measures. If the things that you do make for better products that more people want to buy, uh, you will have higher sales and higher profits and the stock market's very well aware of that. And of course, other stakeholders being your customers, being other people in your company. If you view the immediate recipient of your work, be it in the company or be it external to the company as a customer, and you have measurements that reflect what those customers want and manage properly to those measurements and improve those measurements to deliver better information, better sub-assemblies, better products, better goods, better services, to make that customer's life easier and make that customer happy, be it, again, an internal customer, the immediate recipient at your work, the ultimate customer, the person that buys what it is you're contributing to making, or the consumer, the person that actually ends up using whatever was sold. It might not be the customer that bought it, like baby for baby food doesn't buy the ba baby food. The mother or father buys the baby food. The parents buy the baby food. 
and give it to the give it to the baby who is the ultimate consumer. Same applies to like dog food. So if you don't measure it, you'll never know your level of performance of the process in question. You'll never know if anything you did had any impact on improving the performance of the process you are measuring. So measurements are kind of important. The better you can use your measurement, uh, the better you can define and uh, measure what it is you're doing, the better off you'll be. Again, I, I want to caution that it's not always the case. Uh, one of the famous Japanese quality gurus, uh, Genichi Taguchi, said the simple hardest thing in establishing a process improvement is to find the right measurement or set of measurements. Uh, typical performance measures. We've already talked about the financial ones. But there's customer and market. There's quality. There's time. Time is a great measure. It's like money. If I can reduce the amount of time it takes me to do anything, and everything, I have an advantage over my, my competitors. If I can design a new car in half the time it takes any other car company to design a new car, think of the advantage I have. Um, it could have to do with your flexibility. Um, a lot of times they call the measurements in this area agility. Your ability to react to change and a changing marketplace and to quickly adapt uh, innovation and learning. Uh, what is it that, you know, if you take half the time to uh, produce a new car, but it's a, not, a, not something people want to buy, your innovation is bad. Your learning about the marketplace is bad. What do you want your workforce to learn to be able to uh, operate effectively? So you probably have some measures around that. Productivity and operational efficiency. Well, those are huge in the supply chain. And sustainability. What's your impact on the environment? How much carbon do you put out? How much waste do you generate? And the waste that you generate, uh, have you mitigated that waste and made it something that's um, environmentally friendly? Or do you just dump raw industrial pollutants into the local river like people used to do in the 1950s. Sustainability has become a huge thing because society has demanded it. Companies don't necessarily do things out of altruism, uh, but there are also cases where you, if you sustain things properly, it's actually the right thing to do. If you can find those sustainability issues where you save money, like when I was building warehouses, um, we found out if we put skylights in the warehouse, we didn't have to burn electricity during the day. And if we put LED light bulbs in, when we did burn electricity, we burned a lot less. So you could, if your electricity bill was like $10,000 a month, well, by taking those actions, you use electricity, less, less electricity, maybe take it down to $2,000 a month. And you've also helped the environment and you've used the less electricity so you're less burden on the grid. Uh, financial measures, of course, they take the top priority. It's what organizations, especially for-profit businesses, are for. Even nonprofit businesses have to pay attention to it because if they spend more money than they take in, they will eventually not be able to operate anymore. And that applies to for-profit, not-for-profit. Uh, traditional financial measures are revenue, including earnings from new goods and services and growth, ROI, return on investment, operating profit, pre-tax profit margin, asset utilization, earnings per share, and other liquidity measure. We're probably best at financial measurement, but then we have customer and market measures. Uh, they're used by, to evaluate the customer and stakeholder satisfaction with what it is you provide, the goods and services you provide. It provides a company with uh, customer ratings of specific goods and service features, indicates the relationship between those ratings and the customer's likely future buying behavior. You want to have loyal customers. You don't want people that don't like you. People that like you a lot will tell everybody they know they like you a lot. And people that don't like you very much at all 
or discuss it with you, we'll tell everybody they know that too. Quality. Well, it's, the reason they like you or don't like you oftentimes is rooted in the quality of your goods and services. So goods quality re relates to the physical performance and characteristics of a good. It's way more complicated than that. You're writing a paper on it. And of course, service quality, consisting, consistently meeting or exceeding customer expectations and service delivery system performance for all service encounters. Wouldn't it be nice if you were able to measure your delivery and make amends to how you schedule things and realistic plan, realistically plan your deliveries. Imagine if I want to buy a refrigerator from two, uh, two companies. Both can deliver it um, tomorrow. Wow, that's great. One company says we'll be there between eight and five. You're thinking, I don't know about that. And the other one says we'll be there between 10 and 12. Well, which one would you choose? The one that can be there between 10 and 12. They use this delivery measurement, the on-time delivery, to actually plan better and have statistics in which they could plan how they're going to do their deliveries and then can accurately provide smaller time windows. So that's, a, that's an edge. Uh, service quality, what are the dimensions? There's tangibles, there's reliability, responsiveness, assurance, empathy. Hard to measure empathy, but you can measure the number of complaints you get, which is a measure of empathy. If you get a complaint and the customer is then satisfied, you've obviously treated their complaint with empathy. If you get a complaint and they hang up swearing at you, you probably didn't do well in the empathy department. Uh, service failures are errors in service creation and delivery, pretty much, or hidden prices, perhaps. Or, or, or. Time. Well, time is like money, I said before. You have processing time, you have queue time, which is waiting time. So it's the speed of doing something. If you can do something faster, um, consistently, you should have an advantage. You will, because if time is money, you spend less time doing it, you spend less money doing it. And also with time, you want to look at the variability of the process, which is another strong measure in many of these things that can physically be measured well. And computers lend themselves to this very well, very much. If we're operating all our companies with ERP systems, we're in a good position to have all kinds of information, all kinds of data we can turn into actionable information and measures that can be printed off sometimes hourly, more likely daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, to see how you're doing. But time is another key metric that you want to look at. Well, flexibility, we talked about this agility. Uh, so in goods and services, uh, you might have a flexible design, ability to develop a wide range of customized goods and services to meet different niches niches of the same company, of the same customer base. A volume flexibility, adapt to quickly respond to changes in volume and types of demand. We, talk, we saw how in our discussions on COVID that there was a company that made, made toilet paper, but they made two kinds. They made, and not necessarily in the same factory, not necessarily the same company. The toilet paper you use outside of your house, which is usually in restaurants and workplaces, that are you know, public toilet kind of places and not the best toilet paper in the world. And this, you know, the comfort toilet paper that you use in your house. Well, all of a sudden in March of 2020, everybody was staying home and only using toilet paper in their house. But the volume, the capacity was not there to provide that level of toilet paper. So there was a run on the market as people thought correctly or incorrectly, we're going to have a uh, shortage of toilet paper, which was not a good thing people wanted, but it doesn't happen quickly. The, how quickly can a company adapt? They could have taken advantage of that. If the, uh, the Procter & Gamble, which I think Blake Charmin, if they were uh, able to produce home toilet paper faster than um, 
northern tissue, well, they would have had a tremendous advantage. Same thing happened with uh, disinfecting cleaners, and same thing happened with, again, paper. It was paper towels. And same thing happened with soda, uh, the Coca-Colas and Pepsis of the world. All of a sudden, people were buying probably twice as much, consuming twice as much soda at home. And whereas half the soda consumed before then was from uh, soda fountains at restaurants and workplaces and those kinds of things. So the demand for al aluminum cans, there was a fixed production, all of a sudden spiked up more than they could keep in 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 touch with it. Uh, articles I read just recently said uh, both Coke and Pepsi are reducing all the variants. They call them zombie extensions. You know, you can get now you can get Diet Coke, Coke Zero, regular Coke, and maybe something else. And they've gotten rid of all these other uh, peripheral flavors, orange vanilla, cherry, this, that, and the other thing, and just focusing on their main brands to give people, make sure that they have, it's, 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 it's not wise to have 10 variants of, of Coke Zero if you can only keep three of them on the shelf at any one time. It's better to focus on your primary sellers and keep those on the shelf all the time. So metrics help in all of that. Innovation and learning. Well, it's the ability to create new and unique goods and services that delight customers and create competitive advantages. How do you measure that? How do you put things in place? Well, certainly time, certainly initial success of the product, certainly finding out how you measure customer success for the products you're trying to design and going out and getting the voice of the customer to do this. Uh, learning, so you wanna create, acquire, transfer knowledge and modify the behavior of employees in response to any internal and external change. Let's face it, this is the learning part is a little bit more fuzzy. You're not going to have, I mean, if you have a physical part that has to meet a certain weight, plus or minus a, a, a tolerance, and it has to be a certain length, plus or minus a small tolerance, those things, those physical characteristics can be measured much better than this. Now, when we talk about, let's start talking about productivity and operational efficiency, which is where you're going to have to do some calculations in the homework this week. Productivity is a ratio of output of a process relative to the input. It's quantity of output divided by the quantity of input. The quantity of input can be dollars. How much dollars did we spend to produce one basketball? one football, one pair of shoes, one whatever it is you're making. So it's the cost per unit, basically, in that case. Well, obviously, if I can reduce my cost per unit, my productivity went up. The other thing is, how many can I produce given the quantity of input? Well, one of the quantity of input could be time. How many basketballs can I produce in an hour? Uh, 10 basketballs in an hour. Wow, that's good. Uh, our competitors can do 35 basketballs per hour. Ooh, they have an advantage. And if their cost per unit is lower than yours, good luck. You're going to have trouble. So operational efficiency is the ability to produce goods and services to customers with minimum waste and maximum utilization of resources. So we're going to look at some of these, these measures. Capacity planning. Well, we also look at that. How much stuff can your factory make? Well, there's a limit. Capacity needs, you have to have equipment, you have to have space, you have to have employees, and employees with skills. Obviously, if I have a factory that's only operating one shift a week, one shift a day, like basically the, you know, the eight to four shift, if I want to produce more, I can expand my labor. I can provide some overtime. If my market is growing, I can add a second shift. If I need to produce more, I can have both shifts work some overtime. And I can have them work weekends, which is overtime. If 
production rises further, I can add a third shift. And third shift, 40 hours a week, is not 24-7. It's 24 Monday through, it's 24-7 Monday through Friday. But oftentimes companies add um, a fourth shift, which is a weekend shift, so you don't have to pay overtime. And you're pretty much operating at 24-7. Well, you can't operate at 24-7. You've probably got to have half a day, four hours, or maybe more, depending on the nature of what it is you're making, to maintain the machines, to clean things, to tidy up, to, like I said, service the machines. And one of the measures in maintenance is mean time to failure. How long does it take for this to break or that to break or whatever? And rather than wait for it to break and have maybe secondary damage because a machine malfunctioned and caused other parts to break, why don't we change those ball bearings when we know that the mean time to failure on the ball bearings is, uh, I don't know, 5,000 hours of operation, why don't we, why don't we change it at 4,700 hours in a planned maintenance during a specific time of the week, and we schedule these things out ahead of time so that we can um, make the repairs before we have an unplanned breakage. So planned maintenance, preventative maintenance. You, know, you don't wait for your brakes to you don't wait for your brakes to grind that's metal on metal. You've worn through the brake pads. You change them when the brake pads get thin. There's warning devices, there's a replacement, I guess they call them bars, on tires in the treads that when you wear down to those, the, the noise, the road noise gets louder inside the car because of these bands. And you know, ooh, I probably should consider changing my tire. You don't want to run your tire bald to the point where you have a you know, a flat tire when you're someplace inconvenient. You can change your tires before that. So this is the principle here. And How do you measure that? I mean, if you only have one car and there's like two things in that regard to worry about, three things, oil, lube, oil and lube, tires and brakes, well, you can probably handle that. But if you have 35 really expensive machines, in your factory with all kinds of different needs and things that wear out on a regular basis, you need a plan. You need just a measurement system in order to be able to handle that. So strategic capacity planning. We want to achieve a match between the long-term supply capabilities of an organization and predicted level of long-term demand. Over capacity, your operating costs are too high. Under capacity, you're straining the resources and um, jeopardizing your ability to service your customers, which results in a loss of customers. The unwritten rule here, or the kind of rule of thumb that we use, especially in the warehousing um, world, is do you build a church for Easter Sunday? And that's the day when everybody's going to come out of the woodwork and come to your church. If you build a church where everybody can see, sit comfortably one day a year on Easter Sunday, the rest of the year, you're going to have a cavernous church that's probably half full. And so you're heating a space that's not necessary to be heated. You've built a space that's unnecessary for 51 weeks out of the year. So your costs are going to be too high. Um... Maybe you build a hall with your church, and if there's, uh, use technology a little bit, and their, their church is the size that really satisfies your needs the 50 Sundays or the 48 Sundays, and when you have an overflow, maybe throw in Christmas in there too, you go to your um, fellowship hall or the church hall or other open spaces in the church that are used for different reasons, and you provide a video feed of the service there and people can sit in the same, you know, in the church, but not necessarily in the sanctuary. So don't build a church for Easter Sunday as a rule. Now, how does this work? 
the key capacity questions are what kind of capacity is needed, how much is needed to match demand, when is it needed. Related questions, how much will it cost, what are the potential benefits and risks, are there sustainability issues, should capacity be changed all at once or through several smaller changes. Whenever I was building a new warehouse or dealing with an operational issue regarding capacity, we looked at, and first of all, we had finance department that was stingy with the money. And this all requires capital budgeting. So we would develop a two-phase plan always. What do we need for the next three to five years, but also have a contingency of uh, making sure we had enough space to expand if we needed to, if, especially if we're building a new facility. So take this. Our warehouse is bursting at the seams or about to burst at the seams. If you wait till it's bursting at the seams, uh, you're already too late. You're going to lose sales. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But let's say it's we anticipate it's going to be bursting at the seams if we don't do something. Well, I propose a new warehouse. There's no space in the existing warehouse to expand. There's no land, blah, 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 blah. So we buy a new parcel of land, lease a new parcel of land, build a new building or have someone build a building and lease it. Those are other questions that are not, they're more finance questions than they are operational questions. Then we have a two-phase plan. We make sure the land's big enough to cover us certainly for the next three to five years, but it also should be big enough that if you want to do another expansion, maybe double the size of your existing footprint, you could design the warehouse that you need for the next three to five years, but also have them design at the same time if we're going to expand it to twice the size, what size footprint, how would it look, what's that design going to look like, because that's not the big cost of it, having the, the design done. So then if you continue to grow and four years from now, you anticipate that we're going to be bursting at the seams in even our new warehouse, well, you can dust off the expansion plan, probably revise it a little bit, and you're set to go. So mostly these happen through, I don't know about several smaller changes, but a, a medium change and a long range change. Can a supply chain handle the necessary changes? So capacity decisions are, you want to impact the ability of the organization to meet future demands. You want to affect operating costs. And usually when you affect the operating costs, you want to lower them if possible. Um, they're the major determinant of initial cost. They involve long-term commitment of resources, can affect competitiveness, and uh, have become more important due to the complications globalization has caused. So you need to plan in advance due to the, uh, the consumption, uh, you know, the, the, the competition for financial resources. Many companies are very stingy with it and have a very strict and well rigor and a rigorous um, capital budgeting process. These kinds of capacity decisions involve capital. So there's two things that we define. There's two for measuring capacity. So we started off just talking about uh, measurement in general. We've talked about two, one specific measurement, which is productivity, which you'll have some homework assignments on. And now we're talking about defining and measuring capacity. So here's two things, design capacity and effective capacity. The design capacity is a maximum output rate or service capability an operation process or facility is designed for, or a machine for that matter is designed for. The effective capacity is the design capacity minus allowances for personal time and maintenance. In other words, if you're running something 24 seven, your capacity is going to go down, your, your, your ability to produce goods is going to <coughs> suffer a little bit at shift change. Last I heard, you got to give people a lunch break um, and some other breaks. So you have breaks involved. So you got to take personal time. Uh, some factories, rather than give individual vacation time, 
uh, will shut down a factory two weeks out of the year and mandate that here's your vacation. You're taking vacation now. So many people would take off between Christmas and New Year's uh, for the longest time in the auto industry. They would just shut down the factory and give it to everybody. Because if you're only going to, you can't operate a factory with only 30% of the employees showing up. And of course, you have time for maintenance. So if we look at it, people use the words of efficiency and utilization, but here's, here's a very good definition of efficiency and utilization. Efficiency is the actual output that your factory does in a period of time divided by the effective capacity. Oh, geez, effective and design capacity. I forgot what those were. They were on a previous slide. Effective capacity is your design capacity minus how much how much you plan with 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 unworking time, non-productive time. It's the design capacity minus those lulls in production, if you will. So efficiency is, okay, you said you're going to operate at this capacity. What's your actual compared to that? And express it as a percentage. Utilization is your actual output divided by the design capacity. So the design capacity is if you run this machine 24 seven with their planned maintenance, maybe boiled in to that schedule, how much, what's your capacity? How much do that, you know, when you, when you buy a machine, you think that it, it you know, can make, I don't know, produce at X number of, parts per hour, per week, per day, per shift, per month, per year, however, they, and you're going to get it in all, all those different varieties. But that's assuming a 24, usually design capacity is 24 seven. But you may decide that my effective capacity, well, we're starting up the factory, we're only going to want, run one shift. So in this case, and uh, let's assume that that's the only change. Uh, people can eat while they're producing things. People, you know, so let's say it's going to be less than, uh, instead of 33%, let's take it down to 30% of the design capacity. Because, you know, if you take it down from three shifts to one shift, that's one third. Your effective capacity is one third design capacity. But let's take it down, to one third is 33.33%. .33%. Let's take it down to 30%. That gives us 3% of that shift time for uh, all those other things. So my actual output, how much of that capacity is my actual output using? So if my effective capacity is, uh, I don't know, 200 per shift, but my actual output is only 150, my efficiency, I said I was going to make, uh, in an eight-hour period, I was going to make 200, whatever these things are, and I only use have 150, I'm at three quarters, 75% efficiency. But my utilization now, it, it, it should be, let's say it sh should be 600 because I'm going to run three shifts a day. That would be my design capacity, but I'm only putting out 150. Well, now I have 150 divided by 600, which if you if I get my phone and open my calculator and divide 15 divided by 60, it's 25%. So my efficiency is 75% and my utilization is 25%. Well, I want to hammer my people in the plant to get that efficiency up. But I don't worry about the utilization. And I'll tell you why. Here's an example, another example. Design capacity, 50 trucks per day. This is a warehouse. I can load and unload 50 trucks per day. But my effective capacity is 40 trucks a day because, you know, whatever. I'm, uh, 
lunch breaks, this, that, the other thing, um, the trucks moving in and out of the dock and whatever the case is. And my actual output is 36 trucks per day. So I'm giving you three numbers and you got to memorize, look at the formulas, you don't have to memorize them. Actual output divided by effective output, 36 divided by 40, that's 90. Numbers don't always come out nice like this. In utilization, 36 divided by 50 is 72. Well, I'm pretty happy with the 90%. I might encourage them to try to get to 95 uh, as an interim goal. And I'm also okay with the utilization. And here's why I'm going to tell you why about utilization. As effective capacity is less than or equal to design capacity, efficiency is greater than or equal to utilization. Rule of thumb, when the utilization reaches 80%, you must start thinking about capacity expansion. Why? Well, in factories, um, what could you do? You must start thinking about capacity expansion. Factory, you could add a shift. You could expand the factory if already operating at 24-7. Normally, when I think of utilization, I like to think of a 24-7 kind of schedule for my design capacity. So, but people do it in different ways. I would, you know, so I, I don't have to worry about the factory until that design capacity is above 80%. Warehouses, <clears throat> you have to expand the warehouse or secure a new one if your utilization is 80%. In other words, 80% of your spaces in your warehouse have product in them. You're utilizing 80% of your storage. Why not 100? Well, there's no place to put things if the factor, if the warehouse is full to the gills. And you get some stuff in, you're putting things in the aisle, you're, you're operating inefficiently. You've got to expand. Think about expanding the warehouse when it gets to 80. Why is 80 such a magic number? Well, for expansions, it takes one to two years from the need, from uh, realizing you have a need, to the actual having of the new facility or the expanded facility. You have to have your capital budget approval. Then you have to make, do the building and ordering of the equipment and having that all delivered and make it operational. Waiting until 90 or 95% utilization <clears throat> could result in business disruption. One last thing that I don't think I'm giving homework on, but I may, because I haven't made the homework officially yet, is this idea of throughput. The number of entities completed per unit of time from a process. So it's measured as parts per day, transactions per minute, customers per hour, so it's like a productivity. But when we're talking about a warehouse, the throughput is the number of cases or items moved into or out of a warehouse and out of both in a period of time. The time could be a day, a week, a month, a year. So throughput is something important. Throughput is, and then well, this brings up the point, what kind of measures are better? You know, some of these measures are bigger is better. Some of them are lesser is better. Some of them are... Uh, Hitting their target is better. So throughput, bigger is better. It's like your baseball batting average. The higher it is, the better you are. Defects. Percent defects or number of defects per thousand or million or whatever the case may be. That's like a goal score. The smaller is better. I want zero defects, but I'll never get zero defects but I want to have a few per million, if that's possible. Then there's things that have to be like at a target. Like if I have a, a I don't know, the weight of a baseball. It's not bigger is better. You, know, you don't want a baseball that's the same size as a baseball but weighs a ton. That won't work. You can't even pitch it. You don't want a baseball that's too light. So there's regulations. The, the inflation of a football, if you think of Tom Brady and uh, inflation gate. 
It has to be within certain specifications. You're looking for a target. The yellow lights in Chicago, where how long should a light be yellow? Because when it turns red, they're going to take a photo of you and send you a ticket. So what should that length be? It's a target. Not less is better. Not more is better. You should probably hit some target. Plus or minus a millisecond or two. So these are the kinds of measures. This is a, a gross introduction. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you very much.